Hello, welcome to another episode of the Horror Vision Presents Sticks and Stones, a folk horror discussion. My name is Seanith. <laughs> My name is Antoine. I'm John. <laughs> I'm Ray. I'm Travol Tori. Sorry. <laughs> oh! No! <laughs> <laughs> Ray, I thought you were gonna go like I was. I'm like I'm impressed. He's changing his name to just laughter. It's like Prince. Yeah, it's very progressive of you. So today we're gonna continue. We're gonna continue our folk horror discussion where we seek to kind of define what exactly folk horror is in a time when I think to some degree there are our studios out there that consider it basically a checklist. We've talked about this. I don't want to belabor the point, but we're trying to bring in suggested cinema from all around the world, from all different time eras and present it here as a discussion where is this folk horror? Why is it folk horror? Talk about the movie, whatnot. So John, you picked the movie. So what is the movie? Yeah, the movie is, uh, the Shout from 1978. This is a British film directed by uh, Jerzy Skolomowski, a uh, Polish filmmaker. Most of the listeners would be familiar with this filmmaker through a film he did recently uh, called Eel, a story of a brave little donkey, uh, loosely based on Bresson's Ahasad Balthazar. And this is a film that stars uh, Alan Bates, Susanna York, and a pre-alien John Hurt. And an early Jim Broadbent. It's a pretty True. stacked cast, right? <laughs> it's a gorgeous Tim Curry. And Tim Curry. I was going to say Tim Curry. Oh. Tim Curry. Uh, Susanna York, who really, I feel like people will know from They Shoot Horses, don't they? And also uh, Superman. Images. Oh, this yeah. is no fantasy. Yeah. You guys are saying all the classy movies, and I'm like, Superman, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just real quick want to say, uh, so anyone interested in watching this film before we uh, discuss it, this is on Amazon Prime right now. So go ahead and watch it and then get back to us. Free and commercial free. And commercial free. John, how did you discover this movie? When did you discover this movie? I know you brought it up a couple months ago on a text um, and I had never heard about it, but uh, give me some history. Uh, I'd heard about this uh, film for quite a while. I'd never gotten a chance to see it. Uh, Criterion was doing a special on uh, uh, not folk horror, but just uh, global horror uh, several months ago. And I saw that it was on there and I had an opportunity to watch it and did. And about 10 minutes into the film, I was like, yeah, this is uh, this is something for horror vision for sure. And I got a you know, take this one to Sean and folk. And I, w when I watched it, I mean, the whole concept of folk horror and this being, and how this was like folk horror by a different path, just really kind of ran through my mind. Because one of the things, you know, we talked about, you know, like uh, in previous episodes, what is folk horror and uh, what are a lot of the things that it consists of and, uh, We've laid down, you know, some uh, pretty good criteria, but uh, one that kept running through my mind during that viewing and this viewing is that there aren't very much in the way of uh, what Stephen King calls national pressure points in folk horror. You know, you get where things become kind of a stand in for, you know, something broadly speaking, broadly, you know, political or social, like I think. And I talked about like in our first Sticks and Stones episode, how Frankenstein is sort of like the OG, not the not only the OG horror, but like the OG non-folk horror, like just genuine yeah. horror horror and how that it is and still remains today, hits all these national pressure points. Dracula does about fear of disease and invasion from of immigrants and of the other and so on and so forth you can just go right down the list you know stephen king and pretty so so many of the things that we've watched about you know long legs from what i understand what i'm reading 
Uh, but folklore doesn't. Folklore, the ideas are generally kept very much on a different and more personal individual level, and they tend to go very much in a different direction. So this became kind of clear to me while re-watching uh, The Shout. And I, I love for what it does with so little. It's not a long film. It's like, you know, a good hour and 20 some odd minutes. And I just really love what it does with so little. Um, and that also, and, and we can kind of get into this a little bit later, but what it does with sound, I think it's great. I would love to oh, yeah. use this uh -huh. film as a way to teach sound. It kind of came right uh, right after the conversation, but uh, Coppola's conversation, but uh, uh, a few years before Brian De Palma's blowout. So like what it kind of does with uh, how it, brings sound recording uh, and and paranoia around that and around what we hear and acoustics uh, into the mix I thought was really great. So yeah, be curious to hear what everyone else thinks. I would just real quick like to say, I think that this is a perfect movie to bring up. And one of the things I, I would like to do a series of films, because we know of a couple other, we talked about this in our text thread today, but the where the folk element is based on Britain and their history with the Aborigines of Australia. And this is definitely one of those. There's a couple others I think we can do an episode on. And I feel like that is definitely an example of folk horror because I did this quote on the first episode when we did this. Uh, it's from Woodland's Dark and Days Bewitch, and it's by the author Howard David Ingham. And he said, folk horror, to some degree, is we don't go back. It is the primary tension of folk horror. In other words, society advances, it leaves things behind, and it's that that becomes the stretch, the tension point, right? That's that's a, that's this film. And, and it's also... That's just, this film. And just as a side note, it, it's also... It, it, that's That a whole concept is so endemic to Japanese horror. As well. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah! Like the the wow. whole concept of the onryo and what we get into films like uh, Ringo and Jew on the Grudge, you know, it's like it's very much part and parcel of that. Um, and and yeah, speaking of, I, I think that's also a fantastic idea to explore this idea further about Britain's legacy with the indigenous Australians and how that rolls through not, not just like with a uh, Oz horror, but uh, with you know, films such as this and um, not to speak out of turn, but, you know, Anthony, you know, uh, talking a few weeks ago about uh, Criterion release of Nicholas Rogue's Walkabout, you know, would, I think would make for a pretty good elements companion piece, if I'm being real. And a gorgeous film. Um, funny, uh, Nicholas Rogue comes up again here because uh, originally he was tapped to direct this film and turned it down but it definitely has a rogue feel to it which is interesting some of the the jump cuts are a little wonky but um no you definitely get that feel um so okay well we got to get whoever's second best at because <laughs> uh but but i mean the skill is shown throughout the film it's it's a, it's a gorgeous film beautiful movie and uh i love the Rashomon style unreliable narrative where you have no idea what's what has actually happened or taken place and uh you know you're you're thrown into this um this story and you still have no idea how everyone got to where they are and that adds to the mystique but uh as far as this gap between the past and the uh, the present, I like how we just have this stranger who seemingly walks in from the past and inserts himself into modern day and brings these forgotten and unknown concepts uh, into the forefront. And it's scary. It's, it's terrifying uh, to the people around him or, um, or completely enthralling because, I mean, obviously you see from, from the, uh, the wife character, she's immediately drawn but then you know you have the other elements of well 
is it warranted or is it witchcraft? It's it's the, the elements played with in here are they're amazing, and, and I love how how they they coalesce here. It's it's a it's been a wonderful viewing. I, I watched this last night, and then um, I think I have six minutes left of the film, and, and Cecilia goes, "Hey, we got to go to Costco." I'm like, "Not now, please! I have to see how this ends." But um, we talked about checklists before, and and I think uh, witchcraft is one of those things that's part of it. But there's there's something much uh, deeper in this movie that is pulled from the unknown that 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 the audience uh, has to find mystifying and and I think it's it's warranted and it's earned and that's what makes it a great uh, folk horror film it's 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 fantastic John it's it does this was an amazing selection and I, I definitely need to hunt this down to get a physical copy to add this to to my collection because it's uh it's a phenomenal film it really is stunning in, in many many facets it's stunning yeah um really quick anthony I, I hear what you're saying about kind of the wonky jump cuts but one thing that i the, i think if there's a, images that i can't get out of my head it's these phantasmagorical images where it, that are kind of like rooted in like old shadow play projection where you have like images of john hurt and of alan bates that are like superimposed over the dunes you know those those are the images that'll stay with me and that's kind of what where the thing gets haunting by doing so little i i love the enchantment that the character brings and how how everybody is able to really just fall under a spell even by the end of it when you see we're not spoiling the film well we are going to spoil the film here obviously but um even even by the end, when you see um, uh, Tim Curry's character, he's completely engaged in story and saying, no, the shout is yours. You know, this is, you know, believing every word coming out of his mouth because he's, he's, you know, just that captivating and engaging. And it's, I, I don't know, something about that character build is, is awesome. I like, I like characters like that, just like the, uh, like the lead from Perfume where everybody finds a way to, you know, be enamored by him and i don't know that there's again there's just so much about character build in the story that is it's phenomenal you know just to add to what you're saying anthony like i i actually really enjoyed the fact that as you put it the rashomon style of unreliable narration i i enjoyed the shit out of that like i when it opened with it, it has a great opening and then it cuts away from it and then it goes to seemingly the past we don't know how far into the past and then it introduces the jim curry character and then the guy tell uh, i forget the name of the character but he starts telling the story and i realized because they're like playing this game they're playing this game of cricket in a like a, what is assumingly like a, a sanitarium um and he's already been told that this guy is a patient, that we have an unreliable narrator. And I was like, oh, wow, I have no idea if what I'm about to see is going to be what actually happened or his story. And, it, and he even says, he even prefaces with the doctor, which is so fucking excellent at the line where he's like, I tell him the same story over and over again. I just rearrange the events. But I and and the ending a little bit, but just to keep it exciting. And I'm like, whoa! You just told me right away that you that it's this is that everything about to happen is unreliable. But I'm I'm in I'm in. Let's do this. And then what unfolds is fantastic and hard to believe. But like, there's moments that are just like that, maybe that could like I kind of buying this like, and you're just like. I don't know. It's it's riveting. Like it was very interesting and like very well done. And like I like you said, it's a great character piece. Like the uh, everyone in it is doing a fantastic job. And I think the jump cuts are a little intentional, quite honestly. Like John was kind of pointing out. Like I think like the way that they're cutting away and doing like those crazy cuts and things like that are intentional, like to keep you a little bit jarred and kind of 
add a uh, almost like a dream state to the film. Yeah, it was very like stream of consciousness, like very oh. But it would also be meant to be spastic because of the mind it's coming from that's telling the story. So exactly, in, re in retrospect, it. yeah, I could see how that would be effective. I see your point. Well, I was questioning the whole time too whether that whole story between the couple was that even real, or was the whole thing made up? Um, because, like you guys are saying, everything he said beforehand, um, it really just got me thinking. Oh man, maybe this guy really is just crazy. Not saying he doesn't have maybe this power, but he's convinced himself of this story instead of the fact that he really just murdered his kids. Um, and Ooh, that's, that's what he's telling the poor dude. <laughs> that's interesting. Kind of like a Shutter Island thing where he has just kind of shut down that whole part of um, what had really happened to cope with it. Um, but I loved, uh, I thought it was so weird. And I mean that as a compliment. It was really weird. It made me uncomfortable at times. Um, just the way Crosley was able to like kind of worm in. And this couple seemingly being nice at first and just kind of letting it happen. And then the wife being enamored. Yeah, that is so fucking weird, isn't it? The way he just shows up. like. He just starts talking to him, and I believe from what, because we only see a hand come through and like uh, take the air out of the bicycle tire. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure the inflammation is supposed to be his crossly. So like, then he sets up the whole thing of him having to re-pump up the bike wheel, and they get to meet. He and they get to meet, and he starts an awkward little conversation with them because I was like. Dude, who just starts coming? Who comes up to somebody that they just barely know? Like, I, I would be so weirded out if somebody just came up to me while I'm like just having left church or whatever and being like, hey, so you know, this is all bullshit. And like, you know, the, <laughs> it's all the same thing. Like, I'd be like, okay, cool, man. Like, I would just feel like it's any other homeless person on the street just fucking with me. And I'd be like, okay, I just, I'm going to go home now. Have a good one. But then, like, He's there at his house when he arrives, and like he must have picked up something from that woman to know that like the John I forget the name of the John Hurt character, but like he was going to be cheating on his wife, and but it's a weird kind of cheating, like boosting somebody on a bicycle, like I'm dating you like a fourteen year old. That's that's the cheating he does. But anyway, but yeah, I mean it's a, it's a weird, and then like the politeness of it all is bizarre, like. Oh yeah, come into my house. No problem. I'll get you a meal. Hey, you just pissed off my wife. It's cool. Don't worry about it, bro. Like, what? Well, Crossley is like the total antithesis of the hurt character. That's the thing. Like, um maybe I don't know if it was the maybe the writer of the original story, if he was going through a marriage problem. Because it really like talks about the insecurities that couples have with each other and the relationships. Like Cros yeah. Crosley's the opposite of hurt. He's like confident. He just can talk. He is very handsome. He's a bigger dude than hurt. Who's kind of meek and like, no, sorry, John hurt, but like, <laughs> he's this little kind of guy. And then Crosley comes in and his wife is like enamored by him and even changes her attitude for this new dude too. So I really like that. Them just, how you're showing off your insecurity that you might have with your partner and vice versa. Cause even he was checking out that lady in the church too, but he was a little meek about it. He would look and then look away where Crossley is straight out. Just, Hey yeah. baby, I like you. Let's go. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 And then the, I mean, just the, that cheating scene is like, I was like, I, it, uh, I, I, I love that you brought up that it's it's possibly about like just uh, if the author was in a bad relationship or something because it's not just that she cheats with Crossley 
She submits to Crossley. Oh, yeah. I mean, she sits at his side gets, at the table like a dog. She gets man. naked. She gets down on that bed and she's face down, ass up. And I was like, oh, Jesus. It's so oh, she... like, just take me, bro. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Damn. There's a pull like, quote for the Criterion cheating. Edition. <laughs> she is cheating with a capital C. And I was like, wow. Oof, man! The the first, like the second thing I thought of when everything started happening, I was like, oh, "I'm watching single white warlock." <laughs> comes over, nice. takes over the life. Nice. <laughs> but you find it interesting because uh, Hertz's character also wants him to stay to some degree. He's willing to cuck himself basically so yeah. that he can somehow extract knowledge. From Crosley because of his obsession, his new obsession with mm -hmm. the shout, trying to recreate the sound or, you know, master it himself. So he's, he knows what he's, you know, his intentions are, are nefarious, but at the same time, he uh, again has this new obsession with this thing he's able to will into existence. And, uh, kind of wants him around to see if he can you know steal it or mimic it and so in that regard i mean he kind of bent over himself but yeah so i don't know i don't i never felt bad for his character because of what he allowed in his home yeah that's a good way to he say wel that. he welcomed it you know what i mean and um I go ahead oh no the, the, this was just one of those movies i really thought i'd be yelling at the tv like just kick him out just get him out of there but i i didn't see i felt the opposite i felt kind of bad for them or for at least for her it's um he, i need he's, to he's you he, he feel he's he's trying to do the whole uh, athena shield thing you know, remember from the story of perseus athena shield so he doesn't have to look at medusa directly it was like what he's trying to do with the shout and the whole and there are definitely times where i'm, I'm just like give it up and run you know like yeah. you don't you don't need to hang around and see how this ends but again that's what horror is all about discovery and it's all about you know i know there's something really scary and fucked up behind door number three but i've got to look mm -hmm. you know like you know wily e. coyote don't push the red button what are we going to do as the audience we're going to push that fucking yeah. red button well, are we also supposed to surmise that because of his fascination with sounds and like uh, doing this music that he does, that Crossley possessing this ability is tantalizing to him that he needs to understand it. He needs yeah. to figure Absolutely. out the resonance. Like there's so much about sound and resonance in this film that like, I think it haunts him that there's this sound exists that can kill and he doesn't understand it or know it. Okay, this is going to sound kind of stupid. I wonder, again, if the author had an issue with, like, tinnitus. Oh, that doesn't sound oh, stupid that's at all. A that's a fascinating great. read. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. As, as someone who uh, occasionally suffers from tinnitus myself, yeah, that's possible. Holy shit, Tori. That was brilliant. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, <laughs> I mean, because there's so much of like little sharp noises and stuff in this film that, like, especially that scene with the glass, that, like, yeah. yeah. Damn. Well, I know, like, especially like, okay, house sitting at my mom's, the way this house is built, you can fucking hear everything and like everything on the street. So I know this past two weeks, I've just been like, ah, you know, hear <laughs> the anxiety with any little noise. So was it the, was it the peacock sound that got you? Ah! <laughs> I like the repetitive usage of that throughout the film. It's kind of it's it's an odd. I it's wonder if it's supposed to, to bring you back. You know what I mean? To like kind of root you back. I lived in San Pedro for twelve years, and I knew there were peacocks. We'd go walking to see the peacocks. I never knew that sound that I heard all the time were, was the fucking peacocks. I never knew that. Beautiful no. bird, weird ass noise. <laughs> yeah, really weird noise. I think it's really interesting, like, 
from the the going back to that like the tension of folk horror being we don't go back right so crossley chooses Hurt's character because he's familiar with who he is because he says to him at some point i've heard your music it's empty so when he seeks him out at the church he does so because he knows who he is and i would posit that he he is an agent of he is a modern person bringing the old ways with him into the future and he looks at this person who is this new age musician you know i think kind of based on brian eno is definitely the way i took it and this this person that uh has all these new ideas and he looks at him playing organ in a church and thinks it's ridiculous and not that he necessarily has any reverence for the anglo you know uh saxon church but i think he looks at him as an agent of the new and is like, I'm going to teach this motherfucker about mm -hmm. the old ways, the real ways. And so he goes and chooses him and then inserts himself into his life and just picks it apart, right? So to me, this is 100% a, a folk horror movie for that mm -hmm. reason. It does not have any of... And I think that checklist, like Anthony mentioned, I think that checklist didn't come around until like 10 years ago or so right so i think generally speaking if you're looking at a movie from 20 30 40 years ago and it's a folk horror movie i don't necessarily know that it's going to be disingenuous i mean sure there were probably a bunch no, of i'm not saying it is at all no that, no that's, i know that's... you weren't saying this film was no I, I i understand that but i'm just saying i think you would be hard pressed to find a movie from this era that was i'm sure there probably are some wicker man wannabes but even that i think they were more checking a box for the wicker man than they were like actually considering a folk horror because that terminology didn't really exist or what hadn't been you know put into the vernacular at least for the film going public until what like 15 years ago i forget the exact date but um but this is definitely like i would say this and lepterica so far are probably the most folk horror folk horror that we've watched to me like it, it i see the representation and definitely that that whole thing with the native australians the aborigines i think it's really interesting because these other movies i'm thinking of so you know the opening scene where it's the you know it's Susanna york and hurt are like basically like dozing on the beach right and they're both having the same dream of this this native Australian man in this like tailcoat, this like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Admiral or not Admiral, whatever it is, a military tailcoat kind of skipping across the dunes. And then that comes up later when Crossley like mentions that. Right. But that dreamlike imagery. And one of you even brought up this movie it has a very dreamlike quality. I think a lot of that is because the Aborigines, are where the idea of the dreaming comes from. And that kind of is their folk lore, right? So this is definitely using that. I would also posit, I think this movie feels a lot like a late 80s, early 90s, Vertigo, specifically Alan Moore comic book. I think Alan Moore is a big fucking fan of this movie and other movies like this, this whole era of British horror. Uh because I'm rereading Swamp Thing right now, and I just feel like it just there's just some visceral visual subtext that definitely I was like, my God, it just it matches perfectly. So, well, look at the imagery of Swamp Thing as well. This would be you know an entity from the past that's born of the earth to you know defend or protect or you know get revenge. You can twist it however you like it because Swamp Thing as an entity, you know is is uh more like a uh an ancient spirit? it's it, it feels yeah. like an ancient spirit of the earth you know what i mean i think that's how i would connect it anyway yeah definitely I became kind of um obsessed with the bees Does anybody knows a lot of the bees with crossley like a mm -hmm. bee was always associated with crossley 
Really? Um, I did not notice this. Yeah, when you when he first walks into the house and meets the wife, there's a bee over his head. And anytime pretty much he's in the in that scene, there's always like a bee floating, almost like how I remember like my grandma with her pictures of the saints, you know, they got the little yeah. <laughs> divine light behind him. Uh, there's that and then when he's looking at the wife through the window, you can hear bees buzzing as he's like looking at her. Um I tried looking up, like, was there any significance with the bee and Aborigines? And I guess there kind of is, but I couldn't find much on it. But that brings it back to how, Sean, what you were saying, like this man from the past trying to bring these old ways, like bees represent fertility and like the connection between divine and humans. So I think he's this connection for him, like you were saying, bringing this into his life. Interesting. Yeah, go about it's really fascinating. It like floats, it's just like a little statue she has, and the shot, the way he comes in, it's just perfectly over his head. Who is it that kills a bee at one point? Somebody squashes a bee against the glass. Uh, It's crossly. No, it is crossly. Well, no, he kills a fly. Crossly kills a fly in the house. But John Hurt is torturing a bee when he's trying to get recording. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. So, again, like a musician who's working with like all electronics, no kind of, you know, ancient instruments, torturing a bee, which is a symbolism of the past. It's like, oh, it's coming back oh, to haunt you now. Wow. Tori, holy shit. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, I got I got really into this, John, last night. Thank you very much. I was like, I really uh, went on a rabbit hole. <laughs> Or what about, okay, I have another like weird theory. Do you think, and maybe I'm stretching it, you think it's about, it's uh, criticizing the Brits in Australia and what they did to the culture? Because notice that Crosley, when he's talking about what he learned from the Aborigines, it's only negative. It's stolen. Yeah. Right. Like, it's, it's the shout. It's something that's there to destroy. Oh, um, do you guys? I don't know. Do you see any connection between that, like how colonization? <laughs> yeah, and, well, well, and the and the whole uh, harvesting organs thing, where he's talking about, you know, how like there was like one shaman who can just essentially just reach in your back, steal your kidneys, and then you're just all sewed up. Yeah, and then he talks about having an aboriginal wife. That's it. Okay. They had children. And then he, he killed, killed the children. And then it's all about and then it becomes about theft and displacement. You know, it's like, you know, the Crosley is like completely displacing displacing John Hurt and uh essentially just turning his whole world just inside out. Mm-hmm. And then Crosley talking about how he moved for a long time. Like the Brits? <laughs> yeah. 18 years, right? Um, mm-hmm. Well, 18 years in the bush, right? And then he was kind of just uh, like traveling around since then. I think you got a point there. I think, I think it... Uh... Because he was with these people, and you're right. I mean, he does. He's not. He doesn't come to them with like the positives. He doesn't say like, "Oh, this is like what I learned from being with the Aborigines," and like, you know, even even the story of like how the, I mean, the 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 the, the power. He refers to him as a magician. How the magician uh, brought rain, and how he's described him as being terrifying is, um is a is a negative like he's not saying like oh he you know he was powerful and it was oppressive and everything like that he says no he's he was absolutely terrifying and then like mm-hmm. the description of how he brings rain doesn't seem like a very um, it's, a, it's not a good thing to watch happen like right. oh, that's what you gotta do to bring rain you have to cut yourself from and then rip yourself open like jesus like it sounds fucking terrifying to watch so i think you've got a point there like um 
it could be a uh uh it's funny because Sean brought up that whole concept of white man's burden, and I actually looked up white man's burden. Um, and you saw the Travolta movie? No, no. <laughs> actually, the saying comes from a Rudyard Kipling poem where uh of all literary references. And Kipling was a was, you know, he was a colonialist, and he was trying to convince Americans towards colonizing the poem. The whole point is colonizing um the Philippines and 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 the white man's burden being that the white man has to take out to go out into the world and bring his civility and bring his society and morals to the people who do not have them so oh. yikes the way that like yikes. <laughs> Crossley's cro- yeah and cross but the way that Crossley's read of this of these people and like what their practices is overwhelmingly negative like uh, you know, he, he tells that story, but I mean, you know, if you go back and you look at the uh, uh, the history of colonization in 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 um with the Aborigines uh, in uh, Australia and what those people went through, like, well, I mean, did they always have that practice, or was it possibly a practice that was created because if the white man showed up and he was going to take your children away from you? Your choice was either, well, I guess oh. I can let you take away my children, colonize them, be, teach them the white man's ways, or I can murder them and take them away, take that possibility of them mm-hmm. being stolen away from me and keeping them with the tribe, as it were. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's displacement again. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. like a, and, uh, the lost generation is what it was known as in Australia. And uh, Britain Thank hasn't you. officially yes. po- apologized for the lost generation until like, I want to say like 2012, 2013. Yeah, it was pretty recent that they wow. were like, oh, I guess we messed up. Like, oh, I was living, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 it's like I was living there, like when, when that happened and like, it, it was like received strongly in once in some circles and even in other circles they're just like you know no why are we why are we apologizing for this wow i know i kept thinking too like his children are they like um like all of the the products of war you know how they have the there was a lot of half American children in Vietnam, you know, at a mm-hmm. certain time. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Were they not necessarily killed, but just left there, you know? That's funny. One of the other movies that we'll get to I, uh, in a different episode that deals with a very similar, a lot of similar themes with Australia and, you know, kind of modern versus the uh, native culture. And it deals with the fact that whalers who were, you know, essentially white men would come in and when they saw Aborigines, they killed and raped and pillaged and, you know, Mm -hmm. basically just tore the place up. So that's really interesting about the, uh, like, is the, because I looked, so I don't know very much about Native Australian culture. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I don't think that it's actually a thing where they can kill their children up to a certain age, but I don't know. So I looked a little bit, but then I was like, this isn't the kind of thing I want to look around online because I'm going to find like, you know, there's just going to be so much disinformation or whatever, because I'm sure there's a thousand agendas. So, but I, I think that that really makes sense that it, it is this a, a matter is what he's talking about. He's taking this colonial, like c- colonialist, like white man's approach to like, oh yeah, you you know you can kill your children, uh, kind of exploiting this idea like that maybe it was something where it's like, well, you can either let them be appropriated or you can kill them. I do know that uh, children are not allowed to eat kangaroo meat because they believe it will give them nightmares. I would think it would, man. <laughs> I recently saw a video of a kangaroo, and in 2024, I don't know if it's real, because who knows? It scared the living fuck out of me, man. That thing looked like a jacked up fucking bro from, you know, from Long Orange Beach. County. Yeah, from Orange <laughs> County. I mean, it 
it, and it was like looking at the camera like what's up yeah i'm like it would have tupac <laughs> on in the fucking you know elevated pickup truck and just be roaming around <laughs> waiting to fucking beat somebody's ass <laughs> those are some scary looking things uh i don't think it would ever slot into this show but there's that uh wake and fright movie mm -hmm. that has the notorious sequence where they actually the filmmakers actually went out with a crew because kangaroos are considered vermin in australia and so they people bid contracts to go out as a group and just kill shit tons of them otherwise the population overruns areas and causes you know uh imbalance but it that was very disturbing the first time I happened into that scene. And uh, I guess it would still be disturbing, but it might be less disturbing after that image of that kangaroo. Because that fucking thing scared the shit out of me, man. There are some scary looking beings. Used as a food source also. I mean, you remember the, the intro to Walkabout is the kangaroo meat processing plant where they're just, you know, it's... Mm select cuts of meat that are being you know wrapped at the butchers and sent out to the butchers and whatnot so i mean it's uh it's common it, well i don't know about now but i guess then it was commonplace to kill and eat them as well i'm not sure i've never had a hankering for kangaroo meat but <laughs> I've also, i think I've armies never, is I've bringing that be back assaulted by one either <laughs> armies I'm pretty sure Arby's is bringing that back, you know. Um... Always hating on the Arby's. But I was going to say, I mean, isn't there even that <laughs> plot line in the uh, in the movie Razorback where the two, like, nutcase guys are actually hunting kangaroos so that they can make them into dog meat and, like, ship them in, as dog food? Uh, and, like, they're, and, like they're, so they're vilified because they're out there just hanging, hunting these uh, kangaroos for that. And they don't have like a permit or anything. It's actually legal what they're doing. Yes. Yum. <laughs> so where does this movie put us in our conversation about folk horror? Like, does everybody agree with my assessment? And not, you don't have to. I'm just saying, like, do you guys agree that this is definitely folk horror? Without hesitation, yes, oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But, but like, like when, when I when, like, I think even before uh, we resurrected sticks and stones, I I just knew that this film had folk horror written all over it, and it it was also unique in my view because it's like you know when we think of folk horror, we're usually anchored in the locale where the the folk horror, the folklore. Yeah. Yes. Rather than the folklore traveling to somewhere else and, you know, wreaking havoc, whether that's, you know, in some completely random place or some kind of almost karmic revenge kind of way, you know, with this film. So I kind of thought like the film challenges our conception of what folk horror is, but not so much that we're just like so out in left field and we're grasping at straws. Yeah, if anything, I feel like this is actually, it does challenge it. I think it challenges the popular view of folk horror, but I actually think that's it's imbalanced and that this is the more appropriate view because that tension of we don't go back, I think part of the tension of successful folk horror is there's an element that's like, oh, yes, you fucking do go back or we're going to fuck, you know what I mean? It's like the past is catching up with the modern that's mm -hmm. the thing. It's it's not just the modern saying like we're done, you know, push this away. It's the fact that you can't push it away. You can bury it, but it's you're still standing on top of it, right? Mm. It'll always come back. Mm -hmm. It's always come back, right? So I think this is, man, I don't know. I, I, I feel like if we were to build an access of, I mean, maybe we can do this. I don't know how many points we would use or whatever, but right now, to me, it's like a pyramid where it's like, Lipterica is one one plane and and this is another. Not to discount the other films. I'm, I, I definitely think Field in England and um, The Shrine, like they're, they're in this realm as well. And we're like, Ray and I originally did, what do we do? Uh, Children of the Corn and is it uh, Jug Face? Um, yes. But really, if we're going to look at like, what's the foundational like support 
I, I feel like we we found two to me we found two very strong points of it. I would agree. Yeah, I concur. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think this is I think this is a very strong example of folk horror. So where do we take it now? Um, we're kind of we've been kind of rotating. I don't remember who's uh, Tori. You ne you might be next in the rotation if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm pretty sure I want to take it to. I'm not for certain because I've never seen this movie, but from what I heard, it's very surreal, very fairy tale. Um, I would like to do. Uh, Valerie and her week of wonders next time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What is that on? I, I've I've never seen it. Um, Tubi. <laughs> I think it's on some <laughs> other stuff. I want to say it's on Max right now too. Uh, I'll check right was... now. Actually, I got to do the Tubi, you guys. I'm broke, you know. It's I get it. I get it. And... Uh, besides Tubi. It's on Criterion. It's on something called Cult Picks, which I don't know anything about. But I mean, it's you can rent it from a whole bunch of places. Okay, let's make this our next one. So for those listening, if you would like to continue with us on this folk horror expedition, Valerie and her Week of Wonders will be the next movie. Probably a week or two will do it. Wow. What a great summary that I'm just reading here. A mesmerizing fantasy classic, young Valerie puts on a pair of magic earrings and has a hard time separating reality from fantasy. There's a lecherous priest, vampire, sexual awakening, lesbianism, and a witch hunt. So and then, then you know what? It's so funny because if you on just watch, if you scroll down, people who liked Valerie and a Rick of Wonders also liked the first movie, Alucarda. It sounds exactly like Alucarda. <laughs> Should we possibly, do you guys want to try and like do two and juxtapose it with Alucarda? And we can always choose oh, to jettison sure. Alucarda if it doesn't seem like, but I mean, God damn, if that doesn't sound like Alucarda, it sounds a lot like it. Uh, was the problem with Alucarda, we couldn't find it anywhere? It looks like, oh, oh, mother. Yeah, I think that's the issue because I wanted to do Alucarda instead, but I don't think you could stream it anywhere. Well, how is it? so? Why would you? Son you're right, but why bitch. the hell would they be like people who also, I guess, also liked? Okay, so I guess that's the thing. But yeah, it's all that's only why, dude. It's only on some app called Flix Fling, which I'm not that's gonna, what fucking I was gonna get, say, right? But what in why is this movie? I mean, I've not like it's 2024. Really? Like nobody has been able to uh, I just don't understand. The only time I heard was literally about 10 years ago. Someone did like a 16 millimeter copy at Silent Film Theater in LA. Like and you like know who probably did only. it? Uh, you know who's a huge fan, which I assumed when he started speaking out about it, I thought for sure this would get like, it would be released, right? Guillermo del Toro. Huge Ooh. fan of this fucking movie. He does the introduction. I only saw it because I got it from Netflix when it was through the mail. Anyway. Holy shit. You should have so, stole okay. that DVD. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, yeah, fuck, I should have, huh? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Whatever they would have charged me for it, it would have been a fucking pittance. I've I used to see it at Amoeba for like eighty dollars for the fucking DVD. We only knew then. <laughs> wait, wait. I I just I just checked something because you never know about the internet. The whole movie is available to stream on YouTube. Really? It's not a bad. Yes, and it doesn't look terrible at all. I don't care. I'll watch whatever. Uh, I stream shit on YouTube all the time. <laughs> so should we try? Do you want to try to juxtapose it? And and so we'll watch sure. Valerie, and then if if Alicarda does not, well, I mean either way. I know is there? Is, should we just say for so in case anyone wants to follow along? Should we just watch both? I'm down. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I'm mind. down. Okay. Any closing thoughts for the shout? 
No, John, I just want to say thank you because I would have never, I've never heard of it. I've never seen it. I probably would have skipped over it. Um, So I really appreciate this. This is really cool. Not what I expected in the best way possible. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. I'm, yeah, I was quite taken with this film. I'm glad everyone uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. Those Fran- the Francis Bacon man, the Francis Bacon pictures in that in his like area. Oh yeah. And then, then his wife crawling like that. Oh, yeah. Yes. You oh, that scene. A, I was like, holy shit. He's got a little uh, cutout of Ed- uh, Edvard Munch's uh, The Vampire, like next to his yes. uh, recording equipment. Yeah. Man, that oh. room. Okay, wait. Okay, wait. I'm sorry. Thought real quick. It just came to me. In his room, remember, I think it's Crosley looking through his stuff. Doesn't he find like a bent spoon? I was like, is her a heroin addict? Oh, and then yeah. he finds pills. Yeah, I was like, is her shittier than what we we see? Mm, that's it, interesting. I totally forgot about it. But yeah, I saw the spoon, and I'm thinking, him. Well, maybe he bent it for the noise, but maybe not. <laughs> That's really interesting because he is definitely like they really they they show you his his extramarital whatever but like Ray said they don't really go into it very much so they only give you the briefest window of who this guy is other than the husband right. and I think maybe part of that is because before the movie starts and he meets Crossley I think He's very much his his person is if he, if who he is is a pie graph it's the music and then kind of this like I don't want to say free spirit exactly but he's the smallest portion is the husband right mm-hmm. and because the movie kind of begins with Crossley coming into his life all of that that pie just gets shaved back down and and he he has to be concerned with that you know that becomes everything to him he you don't know what you have till it's gone right right Interesting. what is what the fuck is the thing with the cobbler so well the cobbler is the uh, is the uh uh what's it called his wife yes I mean, but husband. how does um how is is that why they like switch places briefly it, or mm-hmm. okay because i didn't 100 percent understand that or where he goes I, and well i think that's more of just showing how like she's attracted like his wife's attracted to crosley right because that's the total opposite same thing the cobbler's wife he's attracted to he doesn't act on it as much as like his wife and crosley do but same thing she's the total opposite of his wife she's a brunette she's a little bit more busty she's you know going out there to church and stuff so i think it's more of maybe the secret kind of life to he would want if he wasn't doing all this musician stuff but i thought it was a really cool like version of turn of the screw Oh, you're switching for a little bit. Yeah. But, well, sorry, I should have should have brought that up earlier. But I just, no, I no, uh, <laughs> I, I would I would definitely say I would recommend anybody that's listening to this and hasn't seen it. I would still say uh, if you're interested, watch it. I th- it's on Prime. I think it's I think it's a fabulous film. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's good. If you're a fan of Don't Look Now or images or you know just in general 70s cinema like altman um rogue kubrick i think there's something here for you and and like tori said i'd never even heard of this fucking movie before like completely off the radar to me and great cast just really good performances and really interesting and thought-provoking so that's the shout 1978 Stand up and shout. No, oh. Oh, you guys don't like rock star now? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, 
for the horror vision and sticks and stones i'm sean i am frank zappa playing a bicycle wow <laughs> fuck john travolta i'm the real john t fuck yeah oh! fuck yeah oh! Fuck oh, yeah. yeah! Thank you. Say anything I after that? I guess Fuck I'm ready because yeah. John just My... killed it. I'm just Tori because yeah, trapped and fucking mic dropped on all of us right now. <laughs> Fuck. And we'll be back. <laughs> Pandemic of violence floods the streets of major cities as cases of the media dubbed murder virus MV20 soar, causing those infected to go on killing sprees. Caught in the middle, police detective Angela Miller finds her only trustworthy ally in the self proclaimed psychic PI, Gerald Henry. As the two try to navigate the violence, they are drawn into new age guru. Opera Melon Harvest's plot to heal the planet. Harvest's missive? The world is sick, and humanity is the infection. The cure? Murder. From the twisted mind of Sean C. Baker, author of A Collection of Desires, and Shadowplay in Book One, Kim and Jesse, comes his most vicious novel yet, Murder Virus. Available where books are sold.